Greetings and welcome to Gripping Horror. In the small town of Southeast, nestled within Putnam County, New York, exists a flooded pit that plunges an astonishing 600 feet into the earth. This well-kept secret amongst divers has a history of both individuals and items vanishing into its depths, never to re-emerge. Located on private property, the current owners have no interest in diving, nor wish the liability of having divers on site. Beyond its tranquil facade lies the tragic tale of experienced technical diver Bob Thomas, whose momentary lapse in judgment led to a fatal outcome in its unforgiving depths. This is the Tilly Foster cave diving disaster of 2017. Meet 48-year-old Bob Thomas from Jersey City. Always one for adventure, he joined the Navy in 1987 and served until 1993. Following his service, Bob pursued higher education and obtained his master's degree from the University of Buffalo. His professional journey led him to the field of IT, where he'd been thriving ever since most recently working as an enterprise architect for Major League Baseball in New York City. Outside of work, Bob's life had been enriched with remarkable achievements. He scaled mountain summits, indulged in rock climbing for years, and for the past 15 years, he'd been a very active scuba diver, achieving the rank of Master Scuba Diver. In 2013, experienced diver Dan Wright was notified of a deep flooded mine near Brewster, New York. The intrigue being too much to bear, Dan found himself compelled to persuade the owners to allow him and a team, which included Bob, to explore the mine, map it out, and provide legally binding waivers to release them from exposure to lawsuits in the case of a diver injury. It took some time, but by spring of 2014, the team was granted permission. Upon the first survey of the site, they found it was more picturesque than any of the images sent to them or internet searches. Very large, 300 feet by 400 feet across, it looked like a small lake with sheer cliffs and surrounded by foliage. Apparently, there was a diving academy of some sort at one time from the 1980s to the 1990s, evident from the sturdy steel stairwell and steel dive platform on pontoons, still in great shape. The mine waters were spring-fed, and with some flow. Where it flows to was yet unknown. It is the deepest dive site in the tri-state area outside of the ocean. From the jump, it drops 177 feet right off the platform, meaning there is no shallow end. The mine was not merely a deep terraced hole, there were multiple horizontal tunnels of drifts, as miners call them, starting at 300 feet. Some go hundreds of feet until the tunnel played out, others for a short distance. These passageways were meticulously carved out during the late 1870s to the 1880s, a period that coincided with the latter stages of the mining operations. The mine was named for Tilly Foster, who bought the land that the mine was on from George Beale. After Foster's death in 1842, the property passed through several hands before it came into the possession of Harvey Iron and Steel Company. The mine opened in 1853 and employed large numbers of Irish and Italian immigrants. Workers were known by numbers rather than names because the names of immigrants were considered too difficult to pronounce. The mine reached its peak of production in the 1870s it was 600 feet or 180 meters deep. There were 300 miners employed and they were producing 7,000 tons of ore per month. From 1887 to 1889, the mine was made into an open pit, a process which took two years. At one time, it was the largest open pit operation in the world. In 1895, there was a major collapse that killed 13 miners. The mine was closed due to financial difficulties in 1897, all equipment removed and sold off. From this point on in the mine's history, things start to become intriguing. 
After the collapse, it was flooded by a reservoir nearby. The mine was used as a dump for a couple of towns from 1920 to the 1940s. You name it, it was tossed in. Cars, trucks, building materials, tractors, and more. In the 1940s, the Navy was testing sonar equipment there. Owners changed, and the property was closed off to dumping around World War II. The site was known as a body dumping ground for the mob for nearly 50 years, according to reports. One witness still alive today watched a body thrown in the mine in 1938. Other known victims were tossed in during the 1950s and as late as 1995. Routinely, stolen cars were driven into the mine after being stripped. One such vehicle, stolen in 1990, had a stolen safe in the trunk, according to police, never to be located. Miners in the day had called this place King of Shadows because of the massive deaths during mining. Locals persisted calling it that, as nothing thrown in was ever found again. No police search had ever produced anything. On November the 19th, 2017, following four years of the mine's exploration with finds such as the 1988 Monte Carlo, the team reached the site to commence a sequence of exploratory dives for Robin Murphy, a female murdered in 1995 at the age of 17 and dumped in the mine. Finding a needle in a haystack would be a more accurate description than a search, as years of leaves and sediment would now be covering her body. The team mapped the locations where the murderer might have disposed of a weighted body. They planned to carry out dives along the southern and western walls as a starting point. On this occasion, Bob opted to dive without a buddy and entered the mine alone around 12 p.m. Before he entered, he had low gas supply on set and no reserve in case of emergency. Bob dropped his deep bailout tank before even starting the dive and elected to dive without this critical gas reserve, leaving him with no means of dealing with gas emergencies that might arise during the dive. Bob dove to a depth of 171 feet to the bottom of the flooded mine shaft. The temperature starts to warm on the surface, reaching up to 70 degrees. Only 10 feet down, it changes very quickly. Below 40 feet, it is a chilling 42 degrees, all the way to the bottom. The water contains a significant amount of particulate matter, so much so that it's lights out around 80 feet. Below 125 feet, the water clears up with very good visibility. But according to Dan Wright, it's as black as he has ever seen, darker than a cave, as there is no wall for your light to bounce off of if you are in the middle of the site. It is not for the faint of heart. Given the frigid water temperature, Bob required a heated wetsuit to endure the conditions. The cold would have been intolerable otherwise. However, the suit's battery could only sustain the heating for approximately 90 minutes. Amid the chilling temperatures and unsettling darkness, Bob became disorientated underwater. His dive quickly spiraled into a disaster and he became entangled in a mass of wires and cables. Bob wasn't just trapped, he was severely jammed within the wires and cables. Bob ran out of air at 12.34 p.m., or very close to this, as analyzed from his sheer water dive computer, which takes a sample as saves every 10 seconds. His fellow team member, Dan Wright, started his dive at 1 p.m., and was exploring some distance to where Bob was at around 200 feet. He had no idea that Bob was in some terrible situation or dead at this point. By the time he surfaced at 2 p.m., Bob was long gone. Bob's girlfriend called the sheriff's office around 3.50 p.m. and asked police to check on him because he was late for a party at her house. Police went to the mine and found the team members who said that Bob was late surfacing from his dive given his air supply. When questioned by the police about not calling 911, Dan Wright explained that he and the group had intended to return the following morning with additional equipment to search for Bob in the water. Dan then asked if Monica Runswold, who was present on site, along with another male named John Morgan, and himself could depart. State police divers 
in collaboration with Brewster and Mayo Pack 4's fire departments, initiated a search of the mine. They employed sonar equipment to aid in locating Bob. Tragically, his body was located and retrieved around 1 p.m. on the day following his disappearance. State police divers skillfully used a cable extended from the surface to lift Bob's body from the water, concluding the search operation. In July 2018, the Putnam County Sheriff's Department officially closed the case, attributing it to a tragic accident. Subsequently, in September 2018, a stone memorial marker was engraved and erected by some of the dedicated members of the Exploration Project as a tribute to Bob. May Bob rest in peace. He is remembered as an upbeat man whose passion was helping people and diving. A few dedicated men continue in the diving of the deep flooded mine to this day, but many do just a single dive and never return. In the heart of Leicestershire, between Stony Stanton and Broughton Astley, lies Stony Cove. Known as the National Diving Centre of England, this site is used by about 60,000 divers each year. Tragically, at least one diver has drowned each year since the centre opened in 1978. In 2003, the centre was fined £7,500 and ordered to pay more than £40,000 in costs following the death of an amateur diver. Still, its allure continues to pull both experienced and beginner divers into its frigid waters day after day. These are the tragedies of Richard Stansfield and Roger Clark. While England may be known for its rainy weather, ancient Stonehenge and talented musicians don't discount this country's love for scuba diving. The United Kingdom is one of the cold water diving capitals of the world. In fact, with 12,429 kilometers or 7,723 miles of coastline and over 40,000 inland bodies of water, the island maintains a profound connection to the sea. One would think that being an island should mean that coastal diving locations are plentiful in the UK, but even still its diving community has turned towards inland diving amid lakes, locks and quarries. Stony Cove is self-described as the UK's most popular inland diving centre. It is one of three that lie in the village of Stony Stanton. The other two have been infilled. Stony Cove, and ultimately Stony Stanton, is situated in the county of Leicestershire, central England. The quarry first began production at the beginning of the 19th century, when granite was used to repair roads. In 1850, a railway line was built to move granite from the bottom to the top of the pit. When quarrying died out in 1958, spring water, which had been a constant problem during the pit's working years, was allowed to flood the quarry. Diving in the quarry first started around the 1960s. During this time, the quarry was primarily used to train commercial divers en route for the North Sea oil fields. As scuba diving gained popularity, Stony Cove transitioned into the amazing underwater adventure park it is today. While the site is widely enjoyed by all levels of divers, it is still used to train police divers, US Air Force, and even the Historic Diving Society. Stony Cove has numerous underwater attractions, both original and deliberately placed. The site includes a helicopter, bus, boats, armored cars, shipwrecks, and even a submarine. There is also plenty of fish life, such as perch, roach, pike, and crayfish. The 12.5-acre quarry consists of three main levels, a 6-meter shelf area, ideal for beginner training, a 36-meter sump for more advanced training, and the main body consisting of two large 22-meter deep areas. The deepest parts of Stony Cove are dark, cold, and a far cry from the comparatively tropical shallows. This area is strictly for advanced and experienced divers. Temperatures are much colder, and as you descend down from the 20 meter cliff, it feels like somebody switched the lights off. The silty bottom is also a hazard, 
so divers must take care not to disturb the sediment and reduce visibility. The deepest part of the quarry is known as the pit and reaches a maximum depth of 115 feet or 35 meters. For those who are experienced, there is one point of interest in this area, the deep hydro box. Comprising a five meter tall metal structure, the box is designed to provide a dry working environment for underwater tasks, such as welding. Divers exploring the box can swim through the top opening and out through the bottom. Great care must be taken when exploring the box due to the depth, risk of reduced visibility and entering an enclosed overhead space inside the box. Navigating the features in Stony Cove isn't always as simple as may seem, especially if the visibility isn't great. Thus, it's recommended that divers plan a route using multiple waypoints before entering. Nigel Craig, a veteran diver with 20 years of experience, had a deep passion for diving that completely ceased to exist after the 24th of July, 2016. A builder by trade, Nigel had been interested in diving since he was a boy, but it was only when he had his own young family that he embarked on PADI training courses, initially abroad and then in 1996 at Stony Cove, where he practiced his newfound craft. With each dive, he became more entranced with the water, forging a connection that would define his life. As the years passed, Nigel made hundreds of dives at the quarry as a diver. Nigel would attend weekly pool sessions and spend Saturdays at the Dive Northampton shop and Sundays diving. Over time, he had progressed through the training until he qualified as a PADI Master Instructor in 2013. Over the years, he certified 300 students and assisted in the certification of countless others. Among them was a student named Richard Stansfield, who was in the midst of certification process. Richard Stansfield, an electrician from Northampton, was not your typical 40-year-old. With a firm dedication to his work at high-tech electrical, he had gained a reputation for his meticulous attention to detail and innovative problem-solving skills. Yet, beyond his work, Richard harbored a lesser-known passion for diving. His weekends were often spent exploring the depths of Stony Cove, which, after gaining his advanced open water certification, allowed him to venture into more advanced sections. On Sunday, the 24th of July, 2016, Nigel began the PADI Deep Speciality Course Dive for Richard. It was the second dive of the PADI Deep Speciality Course, the first of which Richard had already completed during his advanced open water program. The course helps divers to better understand the effects of pressure at depth and the importance of making safety stops to mitigate the potential for decompression sickness. The maximum allowable depth of the dive is 40 meters and includes a short navigation swim before making a free ascent using gauges or a dive computer to maintain a safe ascent rate. The core standards mandate a three minute safety stop at five meters before surfacing. The day before the dive, Nigel had been through some checks at the Dive Northampton shop with Richard. Richard was Nigel's only dive student that day and was accompanied by dive master, Carol Tokarczyk, with whom he had dived previously and with whom Nigel had worked several times before. After the briefing and safety check, the team swam approximately 100 meters to a descent line, marking the hydro box. The team stopped at the marker buoy to allow an out of breath Richard time to recover after the surface swim. It took around 10 minutes more to reach the dive's maximum depth of approximately 105 feet or 32 meters as Richard had problems equalizing. Nigel took an air check at the bottom and Richard indicated he had 150 bar remaining in his 12 liter cylinder, having started the dive with 250. Nigel and Carol were using 12 liter twin sets, plenty for both themselves and as a contingency supply if necessary. Richard struggled with his buoyancy during his first attempt at the navigation exercise, so Nigel cut him short to repeat the skill, which he did successfully. At this point, Nigel performed a second air check and received a signal for 60 bar in response. 
This was much less than Nigel had expected, based on his earlier check. So he immediately ended the dive and began the ascent, instructing Carol to continuously monitor Richard's gauge on the way up. At about 59 feet, or 18 meters, Richard indicated he was out of air, despite at least 20 bar remaining in his tank. There was no indication of any heavy breathing and no sign of panic. So Nigel decided to swap him onto Carol's alternate regulator. Seeking reassurance from Richard, now breathing from Carol's twin set, the group continued to ascend, but Richard signaled once again that he was out of air. Nigel was confused. He purged the regulator, checked Carol's regulator, and everything was fine. Once again, the group had another out of air, and so Nigel decided to put him on his own regulator. They did the standard, look at my eyes, calm down signals. Once Nigel got the okays, they carried on up. Approaching safety stop depth, Richard indicated he was okay and appeared calm and with a more than adequate reserve of air. Craig judged it prudent to continue with the planned safety stop. As stated earlier, it is a requirement of the course and standard practice for recreational diving. Two minutes into the safety stop, Richard appeared to panic and tried to bolt for the surface, so Nigel reached out to prevent him from making an unsafe ascent, during which the regulator from which he was breathing would have been pulled from his mouth. Nigel held him at the safety stop, made eye contact, checked their computers. They had about a minute or so left. Nigel took a second to think. He didn't understand why Richard was saying he's got no air when he's got air. Then Nigel looked up and Richard's eyes had gone, appearing with a glazed look to them, with his regulators out of his mouth. Nigel indicated to Carol that he was going back to the surface. Nigel filled Richard's buoyancy control device and his own and ascended to the top. Carol took his weights off and ascended as well. On the surface, Nigel shouted for help and started rescue breathing. Richard was taken to the shore by Stony Cove's rescue boat, where he was resuscitated by paramedics and taken by ambulance to hospital. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, however, Richard was pronounced dead some five hours later. Nigel was interviewed by police in the aftermath of the incident and attended a voluntary interview in 2017 to clarify details of his original statement, but he was never treated as a suspect. A British health and safety executive investigation found that neither he nor Dive Northampton had any case to answer. Nigel and his wife, Dealer, moved on with their life as best they could until, in September 2020, more than four years after the tragic events of July 2016, Craig received a letter informing him that he would be prosecuted for gross negligence manslaughter. The prosecution based its entire case on the idea that Craig had held his unwilling student underwater in the misguided belief that a safety stop was more important than preventing him drowning. Commander Baldwin's report into the incident tried to implicate Nigel's dive plan as the starting point for the fatality. Using the rule of thirds, he said, Nigel should have ended the dive as soon as they reached their maximum depth. When Richard signaled, he had 160 bar remaining. Dive computer records submitted as evidence showed that Richard had misreported his air supply by as much as 30 bar during the first air check, which the prosecution told the jury was Craig's fault for not directly observing his student's computer. Crucially, Richard had been diagnosed with high blood pressure, for which he was taking medication and which he had failed to state in his medical declaration prior to taking the course. He was also found to have traces of alcohol and cocaine in his system, although it was not known if these might have had any bearing on the circumstances that led to his death. The crux of the prosecution case, however, was that the safety stop was not necessary and that Craig should have ascended to the surface with his out-of-air diver. A diver signalling out of air when they still have a working supply is a recognised sign of immersion pulmonary oedema, a condition where the lungs spontaneously fill with fluid upon immersion in cold water, which, if untreated, eventually causes the diver to asphyxiate. 
it is most likely to occur in people with high blood pressure, which Richard had. The prosecution largely ignored that IPO was a possibility, claiming that it was not relevant. IPO was first described by Dr. Peter Wilmhurst, a senior member of the UK Diving Medical Committee, in 1989, but the dive community has been slow to recognise its dangers. So, even as late as 2016, very few people knew anything about it. Dive computer printouts submitted as evidence to the court suggested that a small burst of air was released from Richard's tank during the safety stop, which the prosecution's expert witness concluded was air being put into his jacket. In what seemed like an attempt to further denigrate Nigel's competence as an instructor, the prosecution alleged that Craig had deliberately controlled his student's buoyancy to keep him underwater while he drowned. Much of the prosecution's case was debunked by expert technical, military and cave diving instructor Kevin Gurr, who noted in his report for the defence that the dive team had a more than adequate emergency air supply, and because Richard was breathing and appeared calm during their air-sharing ascent, Nigel may have considered the safety stop appropriate. Once the closing arguments had been made, Nigel and his wife had to wait two days while the jury deliberated. With no news coming from the court, the couple discussed their financial future on the assumption he would be jailed. Two days of deliberation resulted in a hung jury. The prosecution, for reasons known only to themselves, decided not to opt for a retrial and the judge directed a verdict of not guilty. But for Nigel and Della, the damage had been done. Nigel lost his sole source of income as he could not cope with working through the month-long trial. He, Della, and their two children struggled through an emotional roller coaster, not knowing if he would be imprisoned. The local dive community lost an experienced and well-regarded instructor. Nigel is quoted on record saying, I will never teach again. I would like to dive again, probably not in this country, but when I was out in Menorca last year, I did a bit of snorkeling and even that messed with my head. I get very emotional very easily now, which was never the case before. Merely two years later, Stony Cove would find itself in the spotlight again. Tragically, another student's life would be lost and an instructor's reputation will be forever tarnished. Lance Palmer, owner of LP Diving and Marine Services, has been in the diving business for over 30 years since leaving the military. Trained as a commercial diver, he has a wide background in many diving arenas, including working in the film industry as a marine supervisor on many films, including blockbusters such as 1917, James Bond and Mamma Mia. Having established himself as a commercial diver, Lance set up his own business, servicing diving equipment for the recreational diving sector, which quickly grew into the business it is today. A busy service center catering for divers, air gunners and paintball enthusiasts. The current site has been in operation for many years and is now a familiar dive center within the community. In June 2018, Lance was conducting an entry-level Technical Diving International Closed Circuit Rebreather course, in which Roger Clark, a 55-year-old experienced recreational diver and father of two, was taking part in. During the inquest, it was revealed that Lance had serviced Roger's rebreather before the dive, which expert testimony found was carried out with significant failings. After completing their pre-dive checks and gearing up, the pair began their descent into the depths, along with a rescue diver. According to expert testimony, the rescue diver, which was chosen by Lance, was not adequately qualified and should not have been assigned for the dive. The course standards mandate a maximum depth for the dive of 98 feet, or 30 meters. However, Lance took Roger to Stony Cove Sump, an area with a maximum depth of 35 meters and known for its poor visibility. The trio went as deep as 115 feet, or 35 meters, which, in the plankton-rich waters of this quarry, made it very green and dark. While in the sump, Roger's rebreather issued a number of alarms, 
requiring him to bail out onto his backup cylinder. However, Lance did not notice this, as he failed to remain in close enough proximity to monitor Roger, who was totally reliant on him, which meant he did not notice the audible and visual alarm sounding on Roger's breathing device. As the trio navigated around the sump, Roger suddenly became unconscious and, following a failed attempt by Lance and the safety diver to return Roger to the surface, all three divers remained at 35 meters for three minutes, during which time it was shown that Roger had not been using any breathing apparatus. By the time Lance and his safety diver had brought Roger to the surface, he had drowned. After the post-mortem, they took him down to pathology for 18 weeks before they would give him back to his family for the funeral. Therefore, the funeral didn't take place until October the 26th. Lance admitted breaching Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. According to Health and Safety Executive Inspectors, this was a tragic and wholly avoidable incident caused by the failure of Lance Palmer to plan, manage and conduct his diving training in accordance with the law and his training agency's rules. In his conclusion, Ivan Cartwright, area courier for Leicester City and South Leicestershire, found that errors and omissions by Lance and Safety Diver significantly increased the risks associated with the dive and may have caused or contributed to Roger's death. Lance was sentenced at Leicester Magistrates Court on the 25th of January. He was ordered to undertake 50 hours unpaid work and costs of £3,085. In a family impact statement, Roger's widow, Angela, said that her husband's death has left her with a fear of water. She's quoted on record stating, From the day I lost Roger to this day, I cannot get into water, not even a bath, and I can't even put my face into a shower. He was my world. We had a good lifestyle. We had everything. I lost my world and reason to live, and all I wanted to do was curl up and die, and to be with my husband. I have only one regret in my life, not being with my husband when he died. Stony Cove Quarry remains a place of both adventure and caution, where the echoes of past tragedies serve as a somber reminder of the importance of meticulous preparation and utmost safety when exploring its waters. May Richard and Roger rest in peace. On May the 26th, 2013, a fatal accident took place in the deepest cave in Greece. George Terizakis, a young and passionate diver, descended its depth alongside his team on a Sunday afternoon. As the dive concluded, everything appeared to be in order, but for unknown reasons, George lost consciousness, leaving his team, family and friends searching for answers as they grappled with the reality of the situation. This is the 2013 Sydney Cave disaster. Born in Athens, Greece, George Terezakis exuded a remarkable, open-hearted nature, always smiling, giving and sharing. Emerging as a recent addition to the Selas Diving Club, his enthusiasm and motivation set him apart. As he was quite young at 25, they all believed he would evolve into a great cave diver. He loved diving caves and the sea and was extremely happy diving his rebreather that opened up new horizons for him. Five kilometers away from the town of Candela, in a height of 700 meters surrounded by the Arcadian mountains and at the end of a beautiful valley of cultivable areas, there are the springs of Cincy. Since 1990, these springs have become a site that draw the attention of cave divers and speediologists from Greece and abroad. There have been many important expeditions with the assistance of the Helianalic Speediological and Exploration Club and its divers with the milestone to be the one of 2009 when the divers reached the incredible depth of 153 meters, making this cave the most deep in Greece and one of the deepest in Europe. However, the most important expedition until today is the one of 2015, 
record since the cave expedition, when the diver Fontad's Peter Nilis reached 186 meters, breaking the record of Georgos Trevelas, stating that the cave is even deeper. The habitat that can be seen in the video had been set up by the Spelio Club in previous expeditions and was used during the 2015 expedition. The water in the cave is fresh and the temperature is between 10 to 12 degrees. Generally, the visibility is very good, but it differentiates depending on the season and most probably on the rainfalls that change and affect the power with which the water flows out. An important detail of the morphology of the cave is its rambling area. The rocky surfaces have been carved thousands of years by the strength of the waters that gradually create the curved surface. On May the 26th, 2013, the Selas Diving Club arrived at the Stensi Cave. The cave is deep and these dives were all part of the preparation for further exploration as part of the wider Shinji Cave research project. George played a vital role as a support diver amongst a team of four, all equipped with Megalodon rebreathers. George was using an axial scrubber for the dive. The scrubber sits in the canister and needs to be pulled up with a finger in order to retrieve it, which is a small inconvenience for divers. To make this process easier, George attached two small cords, one at each end as seen by these pictures. The length of the knobs of the cord was exactly the right length to sit on the canister two O-rings. While inserting the scrubber, the line went inside the hole and stuck between the scrubber and the head O-ring. The line was thin enough so that the knots could squeeze in. Had it been a little thicker, it would not allow the head to sit in. The knobs were sitting exactly on the two O-rings, creating a small gap allowing carbon dioxide bypass. The bypass was very small, but enough to have slowly and cumulatively increasing CO2 levels. No pre-dive test or checklist can detect this problem, as a simple pre-breathing will not be long enough to notice problems. Shortly after one o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the four cave divers began diving. They split into two groups. George with the second of his group dived to a depth of around 60 to 62 meters and made a penetration in a cave corridor for about 400 meters. At the same time, the other group stayed at a depth of 10 to 12 meters. The dive lasted almost two hours. 40 minutes into the dive, carbon dioxide levels reached a very high level and George suddenly became unconscious. The carbon dioxide levels increased slowly, so George did not become aware of the problem until it was too late. Hypercapnia in diving refers to a condition where there is an excessive buildup of carbon dioxide in the body. When the body doesn't effectively eliminate the accumulating CO2, it can lead to symptoms like dizziness, confusion, headache, increased breathing rate, and potentially more serious effects like unconsciousness or even death. At the time of the accident, George was at a depth of 14 to 15 meters, decompressing from the dive. He was spotted within seconds and the closest team member got to him immediately. He was completely unresponsive and not breathing. As this happened just below the habitat, they moved him into the habitat and tried to revive him with no success. Realizing that they were not succeeding, they left him there and came out of the cave looking for help. Ultimately, after two attempts, the lifeless body of George was located at dawn on a Monday. These efforts were carried out by teams of three skilled cave divers, determined to bring closure to the ordeal. George's funeral solemnized his memory at Kai Sariani Cemetery the following Tuesday, May the 28th, 2013. Today, an annual memorial service in honor of George finds its place in the heart of the city, within the walls of the Church of St. George, situated in the courtyard of the Acropolis Museum. Located beneath the crystal clear waters of the Atlantic Ocean, at a depth of approximately 30 meters, and some 700 meters from the scenic coast of Parma, lies Los Camarones Cave. Over the years, the cave has gone by different names, such as Palma Cave and El Juanito. However, None of these names have endured quite like the Cave of Death. Deemed the most dangerous cave in Europe by many, the murky water fatally trapped two divers 
45 years ago and buried two more nearly a decade later. This is the Los Camarones disasters. Francois de Roubaix was born on April the 3rd, 1939, a few weeks before the outbreak of the Second World War. His father, Paul de Roubaix, was an institutional film producer, and his mother, Mimi Indele, painter and cartoonist. Francois was an average student whose favourite subject was drawing, though he also began to develop a passion for music at 15, when his grandmother offered him a harmonica. He discovered a second passion, the sea. After his mother introduced him to underwater fishing during holidays in Toulon and St. Raphael, the de Rubu family bought a property in Corsica in the early 1950s that would serve as a place to unwind for Francois throughout his life. His professional musical career only spanned 10 years, from 1965 to 1975. During that period, he composed for commercials, TV series, shorts, and about 30 feature-length films. To break his intense pace of work and recharge his batteries, whenever he could, Francois practiced his other great passion, scuba diving. In the company of his friends, he discovered the seas and oceans of the globe. He brought back many photos from his travels and had plans of publishing a book on night diving. Francois had a great relationship with Juan José Bentes Castilla, a 29-year-old diving champion hailing from the Canary Islands. Despite his experience, accredited with his titles as a diving champion of Spain and the Canary Islands and a national diving instructor, in 1971, he had moved to Los Cristianos, where he set up an immersion club. During those first years, he became acquainted with the local fauna as an underwater photographer and defender of these species. He always said that he would never work in an office, that he was a free being, and that the only thing he liked was nature and the sea. Francois arrived on November the 16th, 1975, with his partner Rosario and son Benjamin in the Canary Islands. Francois knew the cave in question, having been there several times to take photos for the book he was preparing. On November the 20th, he was accompanied by Juan for the night dive. Additionally, Francois's wife, son and a captain were part of the group. After a short boat ride 700 metres from the coast of Palmar, they anchored near the fish farms and prepared to descend. Francois and Juan geared up and swam down from the boat to a depth of 33 metres. The statue of Our Lady of Carmen stood tall at the bottom of the sea floor, said to bless all those who dived in the Tenerife Sea. Los Camarones Cave is considered to be one of the most treacherous caves among diving enthusiasts. Between 60 and 100 divers swim down every day, but they never enter the cave. Even though many of the dive shops frequently visit this site, most of them do not take divers inside. Even with a full cave certification, the dive shops hesitate to let divers into the cave because the dive masters are not cave trained and their resources are tied in guiding the main group outside of the cave. The cave seems very straightforward but should not be underestimated. Unlike most caves closer to the coast, Los Camarones has no air bubbles to breathe but its worst trap is hidden in the sediment that lies at the bottom, a time bomb as the sudden movement of any fish alerted by torches or improper flapping by divers causes a cloud of silt that destroys visibility for hours. Divers would be pushing it going even just 10 meters without a line. Once inside, it can be practically impossible to exit. According to testimony of those who have accessed its interior, the grotto is the closest thing to a death trap. It is recommended that divers who want to explore the cave completely need to plan for 30 minutes cave time, even though the distances are not that long. At that range, you can stay 30 minutes, no more, because to get out is much more demanding than other caves, explained the documentary photographer and publicist of the island seabed, Sergio Hanquit, who has visited Los Camarones on several occasions. The entrance of the cave is located at a depth of 33 meters and about four meters high but it gets shallower when divers penetrate further. In the cave, there are two main branches that are connected by a short tunnel. 
This tunnel can be quite low depending on how the sand has moved. The right-hand branch turns left and becomes very narrow at a depth of 24 meters, and then it turns back on itself in a U-shape. Occasionally, the local divers have left a guideline on either of the branches, but usually this line hangs off the ceiling and there is a risk of getting entangled with divers' valves. On the day of the dive, both Francois and Juan had been reckless, as they had dived with no safety equipment. Before entering Los Camarones, Francois and Juan did not lay a guideline. Furthermore, their air tanks were only filled for a 30-minute dive duration, and they did not have any spare tanks available in case of emergency. After taking a few pictures, including close-ups, they tried to find the exit of the cave, but the water had suddenly become turbid, preventing any visibility. The two men turned in circles, and without a line, it was impossible to find a way out. A leading theory regarding the cause of the silt-out suggests that a dormant giant stingray, disturbed by Francois and Juan, had been woken up and stirred up the sandy floor, causing a thick fog. In a statement in Benjamin Rue's biography, he goes on to say, I was with my mother on the diving boat that day. I was only six and a half months old, so I have no memory of it. But I sometimes imagine the Tenerife Bay, the shimmering sea, the late afternoon sun, and the captain saying to my mother, There is no more air in the canisters. They should have come back up. Help arrived that same evening. But the suspended sand inside the cave forced the Garda Civil's special group for underwater operations, in charge of the recovery, to postpone the operation. Therefore, they didn't fish up the two bodies until the following morning. Based on reports of GEAS rescue divers, bruises and scratches could be seen on Francois and Juan's bodies, which gives us a glimpse into the horror they must have experienced as they fought to get out of the cave. According to some accounts, Juan sacrificed himself by giving Francois his bottle to try and get out. Maria Elder, Juan José Bentes' widow, explained in a statement to Television Canaria that her husband would give his life for any student, but for Francois even more. And that, in her opinion, Juan went to the top. But when he looked back and saw Francois was not coming, he went back to the cave to get him out, and neither survived. Francois escalated the event internationally, especially in France, where his death caused a great stir. His passing sent shockwaves through the artistic community, as the visionary composer was hailed as a true pioneer of his era. His final resting place lays in the serene cemetery of Arona, nestled on a tranquil Spanish island amidst the vast Atlantic. Juan was buried in the Canaries, but the whereabouts are unknown. His friends spoke of him as a hero, a term used by several of those attending the tribute held at the Auditoria Infanta Leonor de los Cristianos on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of his death, in which the Councillor for Culture of Arona, Leopoldo Diaz Alda, presented a plaque to his family which was collected by his grandson. Nine years after the accident, on the 26th of April 1984, the Cuava de las Camarones made media headlines again. Two German divers, Henry Sarpentin, a 38-year-old instructor at a diving club in Playa de las Americas, and 17-year-old Jan Stenner, one of his students who was spending his holidays in Tenerife, were also caught in the deadly grotto when they took part in a dive around the cave with a dozen other divers. The dive was organized by a German diving club in Tenerife, and included experienced divers as well as beginners, like Jan Stenner. The group was excited to explore the mysterious cave, unaware of the tragic events that had taken place there almost a decade earlier. Several divers have pointed out the strange sensation they have experienced at the entrance of the cave, as if time suddenly stopped. After the dive was over, they noticed that one of the divers was missing. Henry Sarpentine, the instructor, became increasingly worried and decided to return to the cave in a desperate attempt to rescue his student, who is now identified as Jan Stenner. He swam back into the cave knowing that his oxygen reserves were low. Despite the danger, Henry continued his search for Jens, but unfortunately, 
neither him or Jens would return. The GEAS divers face many challenges during the rescue operation due to the difficult conditions of the cave. The suspended sand made it hard for them to navigate and the limited visibility added to the difficulty. As they searched for the missing divers, they were forced to postpone the operation for 24 hours due to the dangerous conditions, similarly to Juan and Francois's body recovery. They discovered the bodies of the two German divers along with a video camera and a lead belt. The footage from the camera was examined and provided valuable information for future diving expeditions in the cave, but was never released to the public due to the wish of their family members. After the second accident, Los Camarones was classified as the most deadly underwater cave in Europe. The unique rock formations and the diverse marine life continue to attract hundreds of divers every year. However, the cave itself remained a no-go zone, with strict warnings in place against entering the deadly grotto. The local authorities have taken measures to ensure the safety of visitors, such as setting up an underwater path with signs that guide divers around the perimeter of the cave. The area is also regularly monitored by diving instructors and safety experts. Members of the Mondo de Silanzo Association, a non-profit organization dedicated to the defense and protection of the marine environment, placed on January the 1st an iron cross measuring one meter high and weighing 80 kilos at the entrance of the cave. In memory of the victims and to warn of the risk within, the lives lost in Los Camarones may be gone, but they are not forgotten. Cave diving is a trial enough when you do have the proper training and certification. When you do it without the certification, you may be chewing off way more than you can handle. It's like flying a plane without being trained to fly. Tragically, numerous divers have lost their lives in Jackson Blue Springs and a common factor among these incidents is the lack of cave certification. Among those who faced trouble at Jackson Blue was Harry F. Melissa, who found himself stuck deep underwater while diving with a friend. Shockingly, Harry himself did not possess the cave certification required for such a perilous dive. This is the story of Harry and the Jackson Blue disaster of 2007. Harry F. Melissa, aged 48, was born in Lancaster, Ohio, in 1959, where he lived most of his life. However, for the past five years, he had been residing in Mariana, Florida. He was a devoted family man with a loving wife named Pat Melissa and two young daughters, Stephanie and Katrina Melissa. Professionally, Harry was the owner and operator of Air Services, a successful business that specialized in designing and building automotive paint booths. Beyond his work, Harry had a passion for diving. He had been a certified open water diver for over two decades. However, despite his experience, he never pursued the required certification for cave diving. Still, he frequently dove into caves, enjoying the wonders of places like Twin Caves and Hole in the Wall at Merritt's Mill Pond in Mariana. Cave certification is of utmost importance in cave diving due to the distinct and demanding nature of cave environments. Unlike open water diving, where access to the surface is unrestricted, cave diving involves navigating through tight spaces with limited visibility and potential hazards. This certification is crucial for the safety of divers as it provides specialized training and knowledge to address the unique challenges posed by caves. On March the 5th, 2007, Harry Millicer, along with a friend of his, Gordon Smith, who only had a basic cave diving certification, set out for an afternoon of diving. Harry and Gordon geared up and checked each other's equipment, ready for their dive. Before they could enter the cave, they needed to swim across a shallow eel grass bed, thriving near the spring entrance. As they approached the cave, they could sense the water's flow becoming stronger. The cave released a remarkable 60 million gallons of water per day, making it similar to swimming against a swift river current. Harry took the lead and ventured inside. As they entered the cavern zone, they adjusted their buoyancy to navigate the smaller section where the flow gets really strong. The water was exceptionally clear, 
with no suspended particles rushing past, only the serene yet unwavering force of moving water. Once through the narrow entrance, they were still swimming upstream, although the flow was slightly less intense. Cave divers generally use a frog kick to minimize disturbing the bottom, but this kick is not as powerful as a normal flutter kick, so the pair progress slowly. Despite the challenges, they pressed on in the cavern zone, with the entrance's light still visible. They encountered a fascinating little restriction, providing an excellent opportunity for practice and skill refinement. As Harry and Gordon swam, they eventually reached the stop sign marking the end of the cavern zone. Passing this sign, daylight vanished, and they knew they had entered the exclusive realm of cave divers. This sign served as a crucial reminder that cave diving requires proper training and equipment. Undeterred, the pair continued their journey beyond the stop sign, approaching a crack known as the chimney, where the cave descended deeper. The path wasn't entirely vertical, but it had a steep incline. The strong water flow seemed to be cautioning them to stay away, but in reality, this was the way into the cave. Following the main line, they descended further into the chimney. At the bottom, they encountered a narrow section that required some effort to navigate. Fortunately, it opened up into a larger, wider area with a weaker water flow, making their progress easier. Not too long after, they reached a pair of line arrows at a distance of about 600 feet. These arrows usually indicated the way out, but when two arrows were present, it signified a nearby side passage. Now exploring the side passage, Harry and Gordon delved into a section of the cave they had never seen before, making the experience truly thrilling. In an instant, just as their progress seemed to be going well, it turned into a nightmare. In cave diving, when you push your limits or experience level, you're essentially putting your life on the line. Harry had become stuck in a small opening in this side passage, and Gordon had no way of freeing him. In a panic, Gordon surfaced and called for help. Left alone and trapped 700 feet from the entrance, one could only imagine the overwhelming sense of panic circulating through Harry's mind. The comments on the case strongly suggest that Harry's lack of being cave certified influenced the way he reacted to the situation. There is a prevailing belief that had Harry been cave certified, he would never have found himself in a situation where he had got stuck. The sheriff's office and local cave diving expert, Ed Sorensen, responded within minutes. The sheriff's diving squad is not cave certified, so Ed Sorensen was tasked with the responsibility to search inside the spring cave for Harry. He was in the water three minutes later and used a motorized scooter to reach Melissa as quick as possible. Ed thought he was going to be able to rescue Melissa, but instead found evidence of a fatal panic. Ed was traveling through the crystal clear water of the main passage when he encountered a thick cloud of silt about 700 feet in. He took a side passage to the left and followed the silt to Melissa's body, which was 70 feet down the side passage and 96 feet underwater. Harry had taken off his diving gear, including his tank, which still had oxygen, which was concluded that he removed in a state of panic, and eventually died by drowning as he tried to swim out of the cave. The most time-consuming part of the process in recovering Harry's body was Ed's ascent after locating him, as Ed was required to pause for decompression before leaving the water. At this point in the cave's history, numerous divers from all over the county have tragically drowned often due to the lack of cave certification. Approximately 8 to 12 people have lost their lives at this point to be precise, and unfortunately, this would not be the last case. As we conclude this harrowing tale of cave exploration, it serves as a stark reminder of the significance of cave certification and the potential consequences of overlooking safety protocols. Cave certification is not just a formality, it's a lifeline. Proper training equips divers with the knowledge and techniques essential to navigate through the challenging cave environment safely. Harry's tragic mistake of diving without proper certification reflects the alarming reality that daring to venture into caves unprepared can have dire outcomes.
September the 19th, 2008, a horrific tragedy unfolded in the blue-tinted waters of Jackson Blue Springs. Richard Mork, a passionate and safety-conscious diver, ventured into the serene waters of the spring on a warm Florida afternoon. Everything appeared to be progressing smoothly during the dive, when tragedy struck turning the once peaceful dive into an unimaginable nightmare. This is the Jackson Blue Springs disaster of 2008. Jackson Blue Spring is a shore accessible freshwater dive site located at 5461 Blue Springs Highway in Mariana, Florida. The spring is called Blue Spring by the locals and Jackson Blue by cave divers. Located approximately five miles east of Mariana, at the northeastern end of Merritt's Mill Pond, Jackson Blue Spring holds a significant role as the primary spring responsible for feeding the pond. Along the 4.25 mile stretch from Jackson Spring to the current dam, there are a total of seven other springs. However, the ones that are most known to people, especially divers, include Twin and Hole in the Wall Caves. These two springs are frequently visited due to their accessibility. Jackson Blue Spring is a remarkable natural wonder, known for its unique features and impressive discharge of groundwater. The spring pool itself has an interesting shape with a diameter of approximately 240 feet from southwest to northeast and 233 feet from northwest to southeast. Its maximum depth reaches between 81 to 90 feet or 25 to 27 meters. On the southern shore of the spring pool, you'll find a lowland cypress gum forest, creating a picturesque scene. Meanwhile, the northern half of the pool is bordered by high ground that slopes upward to nearly 20 feet above the water level, offering a stunning view of the surroundings. One of the most captivating aspects of Blue Spring is its consistent water temperature, which stays at a pleasant 68 degrees year-round, which makes it a popular destination for visitors throughout the year. The pool is a first magnitude spring, which means it discharges more than 64 million gallons a day which is enough to keep that entire Merritt's Mill Pond filled with crystal clear water. The water discharge from Blue Spring is believed to have been underground for about 17 years. Therefore, the chemical composition of the water is a result of rainfalls and seepage from that time period. The spring's stunning white limestone cave system beneath its waters offers an alluring opportunity for divers. It is normally a fairly high flow system, which limits penetration unless you're using a scooter. Open water scuba diving and cave diving at Jackson Blue Spring and other springs in the Merritt's Mill Pond area are allowed, given proper permits from the county. The cave system is relatively easy to navigate. It is straightforward in terms of its layout and structure. The map of the cave system shows a main passageway that can be followed. This main passageway is the primary route through the cave. However, the map doesn't indicate the existence of numerous smaller paths within the cave system. These smaller paths might have been forgotten over time, which may indicate the reason these paths are not prominently shown on the map. Consequently, some of these smaller paths may already have a line laid. This can sometimes give inexperienced divers the impression that these paths are open for exploration. Dive experts, on the other hand, advise against venturing into these smaller restrictions. The reason is that there is usually nothing significant to see in these paths, and it's not worth taking the risk. Born in December 1969, Richard Mork was a person who radiated an infinite amount of energy throughout his life. From his earliest days to adulthood, he was known for his unwavering passion and zest for life leaving a lasting impact on all who knew him. Richard's optimistic outlook, coupled with his ability to face challenges with a smile, was truly inspiring. Above all, his love for his children knew no bounds, and he cherished every moment he spent with them. Living on the west side of Houston, Richard possessed an insatiable love for adventure, travel, and exploring new horizons. He was not only an avid skier, but also a passionate scuba diver. It wasn't until 2005, during a work trip to Doha, 
Kata, that he discovered his deep fascination for cave diving. Driven by his newfound passion, Richard wasted no time and underwent comprehensive PADI cavern certification while in Doha, solidifying his skills and knowledge as a diver. During his stay in Doha, Richard seized the opportunity to embark on a scuba trip to Oman, accompanied by two colleagues. Their weekend escapade took them to breathtaking dive sites in the southern regions of Qatar. After forging unforgettable memories in Qatar, Richard eventually returned to his home in Houston following nine eventful months, where his newfound passion continued to grow. His schedule consisted of diving every other weekend. In addition to his physical diving expeditions, Richard actively engaged with various dive forums and clubs, seeking to connect with fellow diving enthusiasts and expand his knowledge. Under the name Packet Sniffer, Richard created his first post on Scuba Board on July the 14th, 2005, upon his return. I have just entered this great sport. I can't believe that I haven't done this earlier. Anyway, I live on the west side of Houston. I just certified for OW in May and have done some dives in Qatar and Oman. I travel a bit in my profession. I just returned from Qatar after being there nine months, which is where I was certified. So, I'm getting back into the swing of things and I'm looking for responsible dive buddies. I'm easy to get along with and really enjoy any adventure. From these small glimpses into Richard's private life, it becomes apparent that he possessed a friendly and outgoing nature, as well as an appetite for adventure. On November the 29th, 2005, Richard became a member of a local diving group called Chum Social Dive Group. City of Houston Underwater Mariners, or Chum, is a Houston scuba club which was founded by a group of divers from all levels of certification and experience to promote diving in Texas and share their experiences from around the world. Little did Richard know at the time, but his decision to become a member of Chum Social Dive Club would serve as the catalyst for a significant relationship with Dan Wiant, another local diver. Richard and Dan would soon form a deep bond, becoming trusted dive buddies. Fast forward three years later, and by now Richard and Dan had extensively explored various caves in Florida, including Eagle's Nest, deep holes in Wakula County, and caves in Mariana and its surrounding areas. Now, 2008, Richard and Dan had made two previous dive trips together in northern Florida in the past year. By this point, they had around 15 dives together as buddies in Florida caves. Richard was the only cave diver Dan had been with who exclusively used a rebreather for his diving equipment. The Megalodon is a fully closed circuit rebreather manufactured by Inner Space Systems Core and Richard's choice of equipment. Unlike traditional scuba gear, a fully closed circuit rebreather does not release gas into the water with each breath, but rather the exhaled gas flows through an absorbent canister where the carbon dioxide is removed. Also, unlike open circuit scuba equipment, a rebreather normally has two gas bottles. One contains pure oxygen, the other contains dilutant, either air or a mixture of helium and oxygen. When a diver breathes on the rebreather, his or her exhaled breath has its carbon dioxide absorbed by a mechanism called the scrubber canister. Oxygen sensors measure the oxygen partial pressure in the gas leaving the canister. The rebreather control electronics and firmware operate a solenoid controlled oxygen ad valve to raise the oxygen concentration back to the desired value to make up for the oxygen that is metabolized by the diver. According to the US Navy dive manual, a hypoxic condition occurs at an oxygen concentration level between 0.16 atmospheres absolute and hyperoxic condition at a level above 1.5 atmospheres absolute. Both conditions can lead to unconsciousness and death. Atmospheres absolute is an essential factor for divers to consider when planning their dives. It helps them determine maximum depth levels, calculate oxygen requirements and plan safe ascent rates in order to avoid decompression sickness. With this knowledge, divers can be confident that they are diving safely and responsibly. Most rebreathers are designed to maintain oxygen concentration 
between 0.75 and 1.3 atmospheres absolute. The Megalodon is normally equipped with two visual displays that allow the diver to monitor the oxygen concentration, battery life and gas cylinder pressures. There is also a heads-up display that provides a visual alert, prompting the diver to check the detailed data on his primary and secondary displays. In the event of failure of the electronic controlled oxygen add valve, the diver would be able to manually add oxygen while monitoring his primary and secondary displays. On Thursday, September the 18th, Dan left Georgetown, Texas for Mariana, Florida around noon. At approximately 3 p.m., he arrived in Houston at the apartment of Richard's friend. Richard was staying with his friend because of Hurricane Ike. During the trip to Mariana, Richard and Dan discussed dive planning for the dives they wanted to do on the trip. They proceeded from Houston to Mariana, Florida, arriving at Cape Adventurer's rental trailer at approximately 1.45 a.m. on September the 19th. The pair rewoke at around 9 a.m. on the same day after getting a few hours of sleep. Richard had fruit and a bowl of instant oatmeal for breakfast. Richard and Dan then drove to the Mariana Winn-Dixie to get lunch supplies. The original plan was to dive hole in the wall cave using one of Ed Sorensen's rental boats. However, when they got to Cave Adventurers, they found that all of his boats were rented, a mistake that was their fault as they had both forgotten to call and reserve a boat. So in turn, they decided to push off their hole in the wall dive until Sunday and instead spend the day doing a couple of dives in Jackson Blue, a site they had both dived together before. From Ed's shop, they headed to the sheriff's office to sign in at approximately 10 a.m. before arriving at Jackson Blue at approximately 10.15 a.m. After arrival, Dan and Richard began to put their gear together and discuss their dive plan. It was agreed that Dan would dive a back mount configuration with a six cubic feet argon bottle, along with two 80 cubic feet aluminium tanks and a 40 cubic feet aluminium tank filled with gas mixture, containing 32% oxygen. In cave diving, back mount refers to a specific positioning of diving equipment, where the diver's primary cylinders, or tanks, are mounted on their back. Richard would use his MEG rebreather, along with his normal rebreather tanks. In addition, Richard equipped himself with two 80 cubic feet aluminium bailout bottles, these stages contain a gas mixture with 32% oxygen. Richard will also have another 40 cubic feet aluminium cylinder as a stage bottle. This stage cylinder also contains a gas mixture with 32% oxygen. The dive plan was for the pair to scooter to about 3,300 feet. Dan was using a long body Gavin, while Richard used an X scooter. Richard had recently done some work on his X scooter so he said he was not comfortable scootering past 3,300 feet. Richard would drop one of his 80 cubic feet aluminium bottles at the back of the trash room to be used for bailout safety use on dives later on Friday and Saturday. After they dropped the scooters, the plan was to swim to approximately 3,900 feet and then make the jump over to Deloitte's Delight, continuing until they hit one-thirds or completed the circuit. As Dan was preparing his gear for the dive, he observed Richard prepping his Meg rebreather for the dive. He watched him analyse and label each of his tanks. Although he did not observe him packing his scrubber canister, his belief is he was using a radial canister. Richard had told Dan on the drive over that his oxygen sensors were 18 months old, but he believed they were still operating within acceptable parameters. Regular maintenance and sensor replacement are crucial to ensure the accuracy and reliability of the oxygen monitoring system in the rebreather. The frequency of changing oxygen sensors in a rebreather can vary depending on the manufacturer's recommendations, the type of sensor used, and the specific model of the rebreather. However, as a general guideline, oxygen sensors in a rebreather typically need to be replaced every 12 months. They geared up and entered the water at approximately 12.45 p.m. Dan initially had an issue with bubbles that was discovered during their air drills. Thankfully, Richard was able to help him correct the issue without Dan having to leave the water. 
Dan observed Richard pre-breathing his rebreather loop. And to the best of his somewhat limited knowledge of rebreathers, Richard performed all of his normal pre-dive checks, as he had seen on previous dives with him. At 1.04pm, they began their dive. Richard leading and Dan following. Both Richard and Dan deployed their oxygen bottles in about 30 feet of water, just inside the entrance. They made it about 100 feet into the cave, when it became obvious that Richard was not happy with the performance of his scooter. He made several adjustments to it, but after approximately three to four minutes, he asked Dan, through hand signals, if he wanted to park the scooters and swim. Dan agreed, so they both turned the pitches down on their scooters and attached them to the beginning of the gold line. At 10 minutes into the dive, they descended down the chimney to a depth of approximately 90 feet. At approximately 900 feet penetration, Dan reached halves and 200 PSI on his first stage bottle, so he shut it down and dropped it on the main line. At the first tee, they proceeded to the right. At approximately 1,500 feet, Richard reached halves and 200 PSI on his second stage, so he shut it down and dropped it on the main line. Unbeknownst to Richard, there were at least two faults with his rebreather that went unnoticed during his preparation for the dive. Firstly, the rebreather's age caused inaccurate oxygen sensor readings. Secondly, there was an issue with the improper assembly of the solenoid-controlled oxygen ad valve. The initial fault caused the rebreather's displays to inaccurately report lower oxygen levels than the actual levels when the oxygen concentration rose above approximately 1.0 atmospheres absolute. As for the second fault, it completely prevented the rebreather from functioning automatically during the entire dive. The solenoid valve was not free-flowing oxygen throughout the approximate hour-long dive. Since the solenoid control valve failed in the open position due to its improper assembly, the oxygen supply to the valve would have had to be turned off, most likely via the oxygen isolation valve that is located on the chest-mounted counterlung. In this setup, Richard would need to manually add oxygen using the add valve, which is also positioned on the counterlung. By bypassing the solenoid valve, Richard took on the responsibility of regulating oxygen concentration. To accomplish this, he must vigilantly monitor the oxygen levels through both the heads-up display and either the primary or secondary handset displays. This attentiveness is essential to prevent the oxygen level from reaching either dangerously low or excessively high levels. This procedure is deemed acceptable in emergency situations allowing a diver to abort a dive and achieve a safe recovery in the event of a solenoid valve failure. However, it is important to emphasize that using this technique as a regular practice to initiate or continue dives is not recommended or accepted. According to NEDU, the Department of Naval Experimental Diving Unit, the intentional closure of the oxygen isolation valve by Richard was likely done with the purpose of preventing gas from freely flowing through the non-functional solenoid-controlled ad valve and entering the breathing loop. Given the positioning and functioning of the isolation valve, there was a potential risk that the oxygen concentration in the breathing loop would rapidly increase to a toxic level. This situation would pose a serious threat to Richard's safety. Richard and Dan reached the third tee at approximately 58 minutes. Richard made a left and headed down the rabbit hole. Dan began to follow Richard down the rabbit hole, but he stopped just inside the entrance. After Richard swam in place for about five seconds, Dan noticed a relatively large amount of bubbles from his head area. Richard continued to swim in place for another five seconds, and Dan flashed him with his primary light. Dan's intention was to get Richard to turn around, so he could suggest that they should take the other direction, around the tee. Almost immediately after Dan flashed Richard, he began to turn around. Belief was that he was acknowledging Dan's flashing, but by the time Richard got turned around, in at most five to ten seconds, Dan could tell something wasn't right. Richard's light was flashing around, like he was holding it loosely, and his movements were jerky, not his normal, very fluid movements. Richard bolted past Dan towards the tee and the entrance, Dan immediately turned to follow and overtake Richard. After several seconds, and almost exactly 60 minutes into the dive, 
Richard stopped swimming. This was about five feet downstream from the third tee and right on top of the gold line. Dan was on top of Richard in less than five seconds. When he reached him, he was jerking and his loop was floating above his head. His loop had been in his mouth just seconds earlier when he swam past Dan. Dan immediately deployed the open circuit regulator from one of his 32% bailout bottles. He put the regulator in Richard's mouth and when he did not immediately attempt to breathe off of it, Dan purged the regulator for him. For the next 15 minutes, Dan held the regulator in Richard's mouth, purging it at regular intervals in the hope that he was getting some gas and at some point he would begin to breathe. At first, it seemed like he might have been trying to breathe, but that quickly subsided and after that, he was completely unresponsive. After 15 minutes, Dan had to make the tough decision to leave Richard as his own gas situation was becoming critical. On the exit, Dan had to stop himself at one point because he was over-breathing his regulators and could not get enough air. He was able to get his breathing back under control and got to the decompression stop without any further incident. Dan performed approximately two minutes of deco on oxygen and then did an ascent. On the surface, there was a group of divers on two pontoon boats geared up for a dive. Dan was able to get their attention and have them call 911. Dan forced himself to wait on the surface for about two minutes due to decompression sickness concerns. Then he exited, went to his car and called Ed Sorensen. Dan briefed Ed on the situation and as he was doing so, he walked up to the front of the park and opened the gate for the emergency personnel. Members of the Jackson County Sheriff's Office dive team and two other certified cave divers recovered the body of Richard from the cave Friday afternoon. The police worked on their reports and Richard's gear was sent to NEDU for evaluation. Due to one of the oxygen sensors being incapable of accurately indicating oxygen concentrations above 1.0 atmospheres absolute and the other two unable to indicate values above 1.5 atmospheres absolute, the readings on the HUD primary and secondary displays would have underestimated the actual oxygen concentration present in the breathing loop. As per NEDU's findings, Richard died due to hyperoxia and since the solenoid valve was not functioning properly, Richard manually added air to compensate for the perceived low oxygen levels. This resulted in an excessive buildup of oxygen in the rebreather, leading to hyperoxia and ultimately causing his death. Attempting to manually control the oxygen concentration with faulty sensors would have proven highly challenging. The risk of maintaining safe levels under such circumstances would have been daunting. Chum decided to rename their Diver of the Year award in honour of Richard. It is now the Richard Packet Sniffer Mork Diver of the Year award. There was a short memorial service in honour of Richard Mork on Saturday, January the 17th at Jackson Blue at 2 p.m. At the conclusion of the service, his family and friends placed a small memorial plaque in Richard's honour in Jackson Blue. As family and friends bid farewell to Richard, they remember the light he brought into their lives and the profound impact of his adventurous and loving soul. May he rest in peace. <laughs>